morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today um, for another Director's Dialogue conversation, um, one that is early in the morning uh, in America and late in the evening in India. Um, I'll be having dialogues like this uh, over coming months, as we have been doing with leaders of arts and culture uh, throughout the world um, and nationally. Um, some discussing important topics of the period, other uh, discussing their museums. And our conversations, I think, will raise more questions than, than answers, of course. Um, uh, that's always the way in the era of the arts. Um, but uh, if you have questions, uh, please do enter them uh, during our dialogue uh, into the question and answer box um, on the platform. So I'm delighted uh, this morning uh, to introduce Abhishek Kodar. Um, Abhishek is a, a global leader uh, from a family of industrialists, uh, a visionary founder um, of the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore. And um, Abhishek and his wife, Radhika, um, have become among the premier collectors of Indian art and Indian contemporary art. And many of the artists in their collection are also in the Hurwitz collection at the Peabody Essex Museum. Abhishek has an extensive background in the arts, we'll ask him about that, and in the art world, uh, building up to an expertise to attempting what is an extraordinary thing, founding a new museum. And uh, he has served on the advisory committee of the uh, National Gallery of Modern Art in Bangalore, and is a trustee of the Art and Photography Foundation and many other organizations. He's a citizen of the world, a, a global traveler, as you might imagine. We're very eager to hear about your new museum, um, its goals, uh, its plans, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to a lively conversation. So first of all, uh, welcome Abhishek. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me on this. It's a great pleasure and uh, thanks for giving us your time. And I thought we might begin uh, by just situating you. Um, you're seated there in your room as I am here in my room in Salem, Massachusetts. But uh, you know, where is Bangalore? You're in southern India. Tell us about it. And I know you have a bit of a um, slide deck, I hope, that might tell us a bit more just to kick us off. But over to you. Well, Bangalore, as you rightly said, is in southern India. It's a relatively newer Indian city. It's also known as the Silicon Valley of India. Uh, it's currently going through the throes of coronavirus with numbers galloping every day. But otherwise, it's a vibrant city. Uh, it's a very crowded city. You would be hearing about the traffic always in Bangalore, but at this time we are experiencing no such things because there are very few people who are out and about. And um, a lot of the American multinationals are in Bangalore. A lot of the IT companies from around the world are here. And it's a rather cosmopolitan buzzing city. Unfortunately, it doesn't have too much happening in the art and culture sector. How many people live in Bangalore? It's a little over 12 million right now. So it's a large city. Yeah. And looking at pictures of it, I mean, there, you have large skyscraper presence, a buzzing modern city, but also a great reputation for uh, food um, and for entertainment. Yep. What sort of uh, foods would I be eating if I was joining you there? Which I hope to. <laughs> yeah, we would love you to come here, but um, I don't know if you know what South Indian food is like. Um, we club it all as South Indian, but even within the South, there are various kinds of cuisines. But the most common things that you would find are what we call idli and dosa and uh, varas and stuff like that, which uh, it's going to take me more than this session to explain to you how they are made and what they taste like. So if we sort of zoom in on Bangalore then, on where you are in the city and um, the concept of building the museum um, and the situation of it, um, tell us about that. You know, uh, there is in the little slideshow that I've prepared about the museum, there's also a slide showing the location. So maybe I can ask, yeah, thank you. So that's MAP, it's the Museum of Art and Photography. Let me go to the next one. That's what the building would look like. It, we are under construction. We were hoping to open at the end of this year, but I think with the three month lockdown, we've had to delay our opening. 
the three months of no construction means a six month delay. So it's only sometime next year that we would open. But uh, the structure is pretty much done. It's the interiors and the uh, slabs that are being cast right now. Um, next slide. Now, just to give you a sense of the location, the dark green that you see here is the main park equivalent to our central park. It's called the Cabin Park. And the three um, circles that you find at the edge of the park are the three museums. And the big circle across the three is where MAP is situated. So we are literally bang in the center of town. And uh, if you were to look at the main uh, secretariat building and the high court and the museum, this all aligns in one line. So it's, it's really on the same axis. So this is where we are located. Uh, Map, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our collections. Can we go to the next slide? So we've divided this into six categories, really. And there's photography, there's classic or pre-modern art, there's modern and contemporary art, there's folk and tribal, textile, craft and design, and popular culture. And the reason we chose these six categories is we wanted there to be something for everyone. Um, next, please. I'm just showing you one slide from each section so that you get a sense of what it is. So pre-modern or classical would mean more like miniature paintings and bronzes and art that was done really more than 100 years ago. Next. Modern and contemporary would mean, um, you know, ever since, uh, I would say really 1940s. And this particular painting you're seeing is uh, Manjeet Baba. In fact, it was his birthday yesterday. He's no more with us, but he was almost like my mentor and my guru. Next. Textile crafts and design, and that's a detail from a Pichwai from the Deccan. Next. Folk and tribal art, that is a painting by Jangar Singh Sham, um, a Gond artist who also unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, he, he was from Madhya Pradesh and uh, came from very, very simple background. And he used to paint on the walls of his home and until he got picked up by an important senior artist who asked him to do some work for a new museum that was being set up and the secretary building in Bhopal. Next. There's popular culture. And uh, if you can see that little video over there, so when you, it's a wind up toy and you wind it up and all the heads and hands go bobbing up and down. Next. And photography. So uh, photography is a large part of the collection and it's right from the beginning of photography till contemporary times. Next, please. Now, MAP is really built on the principle of care. And the care stands for um, conservation, accessibility, research, and education. And it's all driven by technology. And how we plan to deliver this care is through collaboration, attention to detail, respect, and excellence. So we do care twice over. And when we talk about inclusion, uh, we plan to build India's most accessible and inclusive museum. It's quite different here compared to what it's like in the US where many of these things are not stipulated by law. Next, please. Education and outreach is what we take very seriously. We've, even before the museum started, we started uh, our education center and we've had many schools come and thousands of kids who've come to our programs. We've had to take it all online ever since the last four months because of COVID. And um, the challenge really is that a lot of these schools, these kids don't even have access to uh, computers and uh, broadband. So these schools are still struggling and some of these schools haven't yet started. So we still have to figure out how to get to them. Next. Uh, we want our collection to be known and we've been uh, loaning it to museums and foundations across the world to different exhibitions and collaborations that we're doing with them. 
Next, please. Conservation, uh, we've set up a lab. This was done with the help of the Tara Trust. And, um, you know, India has not had the best weather to even handle artworks. And uh, we wanted this to be something which was again set up before we opened the museum, A, to look at our own collections and also become a space that people could come and have their artworks restored. Next. We've been doing a series of talks and lectures, which have all now moved online. And we did most of them in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center. The good thing with COVID is that we've now been able to reach out to a far greater audience and in a geography much beyond Bangalore, which it was restricted to earlier. Next. We've uh, started looking seriously at publications of books and uh, research is a large part of what we are doing. Next. Technology, this is something we take very seriously and uh, we've got some really exciting things planned out, some of which have not been done by any other museum in India. And in some cases, maybe we are also leading in museums around the world. I won't give them all away because there'll have to be something for you to see when you come here, Brian. Great. Next. We are very fortunate to have the leadership that we do. Um, between our trustees, our board members, and our international advisory board, we've got some real stars. And these are people who give so generously of their time and ideas and uh, they are leaders in industry, in uh, the art world, in taxation, in foundations. So we are really, really fortunate and it's thanks to them that we've been able to do a lot of the stuff that we have. Next. We've also been extremely lucky and fortunate to get the support and the help we've got from our patrons, from our uh, founding circle members, from uh, donors who have given off their collections, corporates who've given services and even uh, material that we require. We've recently also had our young patrons uh, program being launched and here what you're seeing is a group of the young patrons when they were with us. Next. And none of this would have been possible without the fantastic team that we have. We are about 42, 43 people. This, what you're seeing here is the senior team. We have the others also, and each one of them has given off their time. They've come from various backgrounds and um, it's a very energized and charged up team. Thank you. That was a wonderful opening. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. And uh, great to see, I mean, such a young team. Uh, I mean, clearly all digital natives uh, and hardly surprising. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the only old person in this year. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel the same, don't worry. But um, tell us about your family business and about growing up and uh, how does an industrialist um, come to want to establish a museum? Well, the business is, uh, we, we have our tea plantations in the hills in South India in the Nilgiris. And uh, we have um, explosives uh, business for the mining industry, industrial explosives. Uh, now, how does explosives and tea land up in art? That's a question that uh, I'm not sure it's di uh, directly linked, but I think I grew up in a family which was very interested in art and with very encouraging parents who um, nudged me in this direction when they saw an interest. And uh, it was at a young age that I had the chance to meet with some of the real leaders in this, uh, in the art world. And in fact, in each of the six disciplines that we've broken up the collection into, I literally met the granddaddy in each one. And they just took me under their wing and one thing led to another. And, you know, I started seeing art. I started spending time with it. And before I knew it, I was hooked. I, I love the, you know, the, the, the idea of map, because a map can be a local map and it can be, of course, a, a map of the world. But uh, just to sort of dive in on this, I mean, it's an obvious sort of question, but um, the distinction of being a museum of art and photography begs the question, 
is photography not art? And, you know, why distinguish between art and photography? You know, we debated. We loved the name map. And uh, we also asked ourselves that, but why put photography and nothing else? And isn't photography art? But that was the time when in India, this debate about photography being art or not was still being asked around. It's quite different when you look at the art world in, in the US and when you look at the art world in India. And uh, we didn't find a better acronym for uh, a better uh, for what P could stand for rather than photography. So we went with map. <laughs> oh, you, picked a, photography. you picked a great name. You know, the whole concept is kind of mind blowing of, you know, establishing a museum. This is a fabulous looking building um, in an incredibly strategic shape. And imagine sort of fast forward 100, 200 years, this is going to be literally the central zone right across from the main public buildings on a beautiful park. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you project um, the way that the ma that map will serve the community in Bangalore? And what's your vision for that? Um, well, you know, we want this to be a museum for the city and for the people. And uh, in India, there really isn't much of a museum going culture, Brian. In fact, if you were to look at it, we have some of the largest, busiest cities, most crowded cities in the world. But our visitor numbers in our museums are dismally low. In fact, the joke is that if you want to go to a place where there's nobody, you go to a museum in India. So we have overcrowded cities, but really, really dismally populated museums. And we want to change that. Um, art has had such a huge impact in my life, and I've seen the way it's changed my life. And um, one reason for doing this museum was how can we bring this facility available to everybody else here? and not the way the Indian museums are generally perceived. Please understand that uh, most of the museums, in fact, I would imagine it would be 95% of the museums in India are all government museums. And many of those museums are there for the sake of being there. A lot of them are now changing the way they do stuff and some of them have become much, much better than they were. But for a lot of them, they are not taken as a real, it's not for the love of art that they exist. And even the experience as a visitor that you would have there would leave you wanting more. And sometimes it is so underwhelming that it doesn't even excite you to want to go back. So we want to change all that. And when you say, who do we serve? I think we want to serve everyone. Uh, we are looking at the local schools and reaching out to them. We are looking at the arts organizations in the city, the other cultural organizations. Uh, we are reaching out. In fact, we've been very fortunate to be selected by the Gen Pact for their fellowship award, where, you know, measuring social impact, which is such an important aspect for any arts organization. We all know that it makes a difference, but we don't know how to measure it. And they have given us uh, the fellowship where they're giving us three people just to draw up the metrics as to how we can measure the impact that we would be having and how to evaluate that. So they'll be working with us for a year and in fact, they're starting next week. So we, we really want to be there to make a difference to everyone's life and uh, stand for each one so that they can find something that they resonate with in the museum. Wow. Um, I have a few questions that are coming in, so I want to take those as, as we go. And um, one is rather interesting, I think, just to get to a different sort of plane, because I know this is so important to you. What are some of the spe specific ways, Abhishek, that you believe that art can be transformative? Uh, I think it's one is really to give people the opportunity to see it. Um, I was fortunate that I had the teachers that I did and the ones who would take me to shows. I mean, Manjeet was one which I pointed out that painting. I can't tell you to how many artists he's taken to their studios, to their exhibitions that he's taken me to. 
So I think if you have access to a mentor or even a place which can open your eyes to what it, it's really nudging somebody when they have an interest. Unfortunately, in India, we haven't found the earlier museums which did that very effectively. Today, museums are becoming a lot more uh, sensitive to the needs of the people. And I think it's changing, but it wasn't so much when I was growing up here. So I think it becomes transformative when uh, the reason we looked at doing it with kids to start off is uh, it's funny when you, when you speak to people in different corporates as to when was the last time you visited an Indian museum. And they would say, you know, when we were eight years of age and we went on a school trip. And I said, and why haven't you gone back ever since? And they said, because the whole experience was just something that we enjoyed. And I said, and when was the last time you visited a museum when you went overseas? And they said, oh, it was last summer or it was, you know, on my last trip. So it's not that they're not interested in art. It's just that we don't have those places, those temples over here. And if, there are enough museums, but they're not doing such a good job with it. And I think once the bar goes higher, everybody will start doing a much better job. And that itself should become transformative talks, shows, um, school groups, outreach programs, all these can have a huge impact on somebody. Mm. One of the aspects of your planning and vision uh, that strikes me as hugely important, um, given the percentage of people, the proportion of population in countries where people have disability of all different kinds, and of course, physical disability is more obvious than, than any mental challenges people might have. But the whole aspect of your inclusive approach around disability strikes me as very inspiring. Um, how did that come about? Is there sort of some personal drive that you have? Um, but Because I, I see that as being um, really something that could be uh, very, very instructive in India, of course, but way beyond India. You know, I must confess, I knew nothing about disability. And in fact, when we were drawing up our plans, we thought that we had done what it needed to be called an inclusive accessible museum. We had grab bars in the toilets, we had ramps going up and because that's the limited experience or knowledge we had about uh, inclusion or accessibility. It was really a conversation that we were having with Emphasis, which is a large IT company over here. And they loved what we were doing. And, uh, we had approached them to come on and be a patron at MAP. And they said, we don't understand anything about art and culture, but we really love what you're doing. Um, but tell us what you're doing about accessibility. And when we told them that this is what we are doing, they said, this is not accessibility. Let us tell you what accessibility is. And it was just opening a, a world that we hadn't even thought about. And I said, you know, we'd love to do this. They said, if you say yes, you've got a big grant from us and we'll help you do this. So that's how it really came about. And really? today we are, in fact, um, our inclusion officer. We insisted that we look for somebody with a disability so that we as a team first can get sensitized to what it means to have somebody with a disability on the team and we can understand their needs better so that we can say that we truly preach, practice what we preach and we can, you know, therefore cater to your needs a lot better. Yeah, well, it is inspiring. And uh, in the world of trying to create multi-sensory environments, the fact that you're looking for, you know, attention on issues for people with hearing um, disability or um, vision uh, challenges, uh, I think is very inspiring. You know, I, I'd also like to add here, Brian, that in India, um, there are very, very few places which are even open and accessible to people with disabilities. There is such a stigma attached that a lot of these people, except for when it comes to basic education or travel, they would rather sit at home and their families would rather keep them at home. Mm, yeah. And we definitely don't want that to happen as far as uh, MAP is concerned. And when we talk about disability, we are talking about various kinds of disabilities. Right. Well, it's a journey and you, you, you've started it. One of the questions that's come in from uh, 
and I'm delighted we have so many people in India and in America on this call. It's just so great. But uh, a question, Manji Bawa is one of this person who's asked the question's absolute favorite artists. Um, but they want to know, what was the most important lesson in art or in life that you learned uh, from, from, from the artist? From Manjit? Yes. Um, you know, he, he really taught me how to look at a piece of art. And um, every time I would say, I like this painting, he would ask me, tell me why you like it. And if I said I didn't like it, he would ask me to explain why I didn't like it. And um, I think, you know, till then one just looked and one said whatever one felt, but he made you internalize it and he asked you questions beyond that. And I, I remember there was a particular painting that he had painted. And uh, this was after about seven, eight years of knowing him. And I was commenting on that painting and I said, um, Manjit Bhai, you've done a, a very pretty painting. He said, why do you call it pretty? I said, because this is all it is. There's nothing more in it. He actually dips his brush into black paint and he paints a cross over that painting. He said, today I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to look at how to see art. And I'm glad that you pointed this out to me. So this is not a painting that will leave my studio now. <laughs> Wonderful, a great story. Um, your connection with, uh, with PEM, with the PBD Essex, uh, how did that come about? And obviously you've got connections to America family-wise as well. Tell us about that. So I think it was your chairman, Rob Shapiro, who was introduced by a common friend. And I think I had come to Boston to leave my son Aman for his university about eight or nine years ago. And uh, that's when I met with Rob and he drove me down to Penn. And uh, I was blown away because I had no clue. Of course, I knew that the Hurwitz's collection was there because the Hurwitz's were good friends. And um, what a collection of Indian art that is. So that was really the beginning. And then we've had many visits from people from PEM down to Bangalore. And I guess um, Rob is the, you know, the right start. And it's been no looking back since. I believe we also share another common factor in Andhra Zanto. And Andhra has recently joined the board of uh, the Interna uh, International Advisory Board for MAP. One of the greatest advice that I got, and I've actually talked about this, um, I think it's kind of, if you look at Brian Kennedy being the boss, but it, it's on, on YouTube. But it was the idea of like, you manage yourself, you manage your team and you manage your network. And it just strikes me that you are managing, you know, each of these, but especially building a network. So talk to me a bit about the end to our, our guests about um, collaboration and partnership and how you see this idea of creating a museum in Bangalore that has a global reach. I mean, clearly it connects to the digital world as well. You know, Brian, it's thanks to the team, it's thanks to the leadership, it's thanks to our advisors that I've been able to do that. Uh, when we wanted to build something which was world class and there wasn't a model in India that we could look at. And, you know, funnily, India is not the kind of place that you can just pluck out a model from somewhere and replicate it here. It doesn't work like that. So it, it meant that we had to look around all over the place to see what would fit in. And it was really in that journey that one met so many people and there is so much to learn from everyone and so much to share with everyone. And I think um, that's what really began as a journey into these relationships. And every relationship has ended up being in some way collaborative in nature. And I guess it was really COVID which, uh, you know, our senior team was having a a Zoom session, and we said, do you realize for the first time in the world, every museum in the world today is at the same starting point. Nobody has a single visitor. It doesn't matter how many hundred years you've been around. It doesn't matter if you've not yet opened, but you can't reach out to anybody physically. So the only way you can reach out is digitally. And, you know, when you realize that suddenly the starting line has become the same for everyone, 
it's, I don't think it's ever happened in history before. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, obviously we're having this conversation as well, but you've done some very in innovative projects. I, I just want to mention one, you might tell me about it. Um, it was some months ago, it was called the, the Bouquet of Hope Initiative. Um, that just seemed to me so clever because it just gets you, you just want to participate. Tell us about that. You know, it started off um, as a very simple idea that how do we cheer up everybody right now? This was within, I think, the first four days of the lockdown in India. The only news you were hearing was bad news and sad news. And everybody's mood was depressed. The economy was going down the tube. People didn't know how to spend their time. They were all locked up. Um, and we said, let's cheer everyone up and send them a bouquet of flowers and ask them instead to add a flower and send it back to us. It started just by sending it to the main stakeholders of MAP. Brian, within, I think, 24 hours, we must have received about 250 flowers back. So I called, um, again, our senior team and our head of technology, and we said, we need to do something about this. Somebody from the press picked it up and they said, is this only for a closed group or can this go out beyond that? Can I write about it? Can I share this in turn? So we quickly put together a website and we said, you can add a flower here. And you know, it started like that. Today, I do not know how many thousand flowers we've received and it's now become a fundraising tool. So some corporates have tied up with us and for every flower that they add, MAP makes a donation for COVID relief to give India Foundation. So it started off as one thing and it's become quite something else. And it's, it's like a messaging tool. So you can, uh, you know, Mother's Day was coming at that time and people said, the florists are shut. I do not know how to send my mother flowers. So we said, you can curate a bouquet out of this bouquet and send this on to your mother or to whoever you like. So now there are templates of messages you can choose. So if you went on the bouquet of hope, you can select whichever flowers you like, put that into a bouquet, send that virtually with your message. And people, you, know, you can use it over WhatsApp, over any social media thing. And it's, you know, people are doing the rounds with that. Truly a fantastic project, Abhishek. And congrats to all of your team. I mean, that just has such a reach. Um, one of the things that I think is, is recurrent um, uh, at, at PEM, but throughout the art world, is you know, the breaking down, fortunately and thankfully, of distinctions previously between you know, what is considered art and fine art and what is considered artifact and craft and so on. And it seems to me that in India, you know, you've got a much broader concept of, of what is art anyway, but... Um, you know, one of the things that I, I read recently that you're, you're engaged in is with a, with a graphic novelist. And I know that there's, is there a museum or a gathering of cartoons or graphic art, I think, in Bangalore emerging? Um, uh, but there is a gallery of graphic art. Yeah. Right. So just the concept of graphic art and how much that connects with younger generation and obviously with gaming culture and so on. Can you talk a little bit about your concept of what is art and how broad a definition you can um, embrace? Well, I guess if you look at the scope of the collection, that itself gives you an idea because uh, popular culture is not something that most museums collect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at that time, this was basically used for advertising or for promotion or something. But when you put on the lens of time and look at stuff, when does an artifact or a piece of craft or a piece of advertising become art? When does photography become art? I'm not sure I know the answer, but I do know that uh, I look at it all. You know, you don't use different lenses when you look at a painting versus when you look at a photograph or you look at a poster. So it, it triggers off a similar kind of a reaction in terms of how it speaks to you aesthetically, What's the composition of it? What's it trying to convey? When in time it was meant for? And uh, I'm not sure I even know what the boundaries of art are. Uh, uh, 
if you had asked me about installation art earlier, I wouldn't even have understood is that installation, is that art, but today it is. And every time I go to another show, sometimes I scratch my head and say, is this art? But art is for the person who sees it to decide if it is art. The eye of the beholder. One of our, our um, listeners has gone back to something you said earlier. We were talking about M.F. Hussain, and obviously that's a, um, an incredible story. But the question is, how do you decide what is offensive or not offensive? Very little offends me. But um, I have a strict team who has taken away all these powers from me and they decide what is offensive or not offensive. So I don't have to decide that. <laughs> it's a very I'll big tell you, I'll tell you the only time I've ever put my foot down is when I know if we do something and that's going to invite trouble because of the experiences we've had in the past. So I don't want to take unnecessary risks and to provoke. But if it's a mild risk, I would take it. Mm, right. Somebody else has asked, if you were stranded on a desert island, what three pieces of art would you take with you? How long do I have to live there? <laughs> <laughs> Great response. Great response. Um, th let me ask you, um, you know, one of the privileges of talking with you is that we don't often get to talk to somebody who is a founder. And I like to talk about thinking like a founder and trying to think back to, for example, in 1799 and the East Indian Marine Society in Salem and these mariners who are going around the world and then they come back and they decide that they want to establish a museum and that it would be free and they, it would be open and it will gather the world and bring it to Salem. What are your thoughts in about uh, thinking like a founder? I mean, what are the I mean, obviously, I know that you're, you carry humility with you, but what, what sort of ideas shape a founder's decision to form a museum? You're going to be known as the founder of this museum. You know, I do not know how a founder thinks. I only know how I think. And um, what this journey has taught me is that any ideas I came up with have been changed so dramatically that um, you, I, I think you've just got to listen and you've got to spot a good idea and invite that and do it. I think the reason MAP has um, been able to do all of what we've been able to do is because of A, the advice that we are getting and the help that we've gotten along the way. I mean, take for example, just the story that we spoke about the accessibility part. It's because somebody spoke to us about it. We, did, we thought we were doing whatever was needed, but it was a far cry from what was actually needed. You know, let's face it, I haven't met a founder of a museum in India. We haven't seen a great museum being built here in the recent past. So I don't know what to go by. And whoever gives me a good idea, invariably they are a part of the team and they have to execute that. If, um, you know, thinking of a, this may be a very Salem question to sort of think about a magic wand, but if you could cast a, um, a vision in the future and think about America today, I mean, it's so structured. We have a, an art museum directors association that's more than a hundred years old that has 240 members. And um, we have a, an American Alliance of museums that, it represents you know thousands of museums so in that um, map is um, a new museum within a museum culture that is not um, exercised in the same way what ways do you go about connecting with other museums or is there a, an alliance of museums is there a national association what ways does that what, what is the future for that in your view you mean in India or between India and the US? No, I mean in India. So there's a very advanced sort of model already in that way in America, but clearly not in India. What sort of connections can you make with other museums to advance museum culture? So I don't think there is a formal structured way that there is a museum association in India. Um, though I must say in the last four months, uh, a lot of the museums have collaborated and started doing things together and at least talking to each other. So I think uh, people are beginning to see the benefits of this. 
but uh, there doesn't exist a structure where people come together and share ideas. I think um, each one has been in its own silo so far. But, um, you know, one with budgets being constrained with what's happening, two with uh, digital becoming so important, I see it's going to be very natural that collaborations would happen. I mean, even PEM and MAP sitting together and having this conversation is a result of one of those things. Um, talking about digital collaborations, uh, like you know, we are doing with your museum, Brian, it's that same digital collaboration that we've already spoken to about 40 different museums around the world. And they've all said yes. Yeah, I was inspired by you inviting me to talk with your team because I guarantee you I learned a lot and wanted immediately your team to be talking with our team here in the Peabody Essex because we all I mean, already have started speaking. I believe so in different in different areas, which is is, is very exciting. I've been asked here, um, you know, about uh, the goal of of MAP, whether um, it is um, it, whether built into it is a a belief um, in to use the, the questioner's word, a, a pride in, in Indian art um, over the dominant popularity of, of, of Western art. You, do you think um, that people in India, whether young or, or old, are more appreciative in, of Indian art? What's your sort of sense of all of this? Well, MAP really is a museum for Indian art, Brian, but it doesn't mean that we would only be showing Indian art. Our collection is Indian. And I think initially to sensitize people and show them Indian art would be more our objective. But having said that, we already have, um, I think two or three artists that we are speaking to in our opening year, whose shows we'll be doing, which are either working in India, but are not from India, and some who are not even, you know, it's not even based on Indian work, but it's work being shown in India for the first time. Mm -hmm. In terms of the role of uh, a museum, a, a questioner has asked about a museum being a, a place of respite and, and um, reflection. Um, you may believe that, but what else do you believe a museum is? I think it's inspiration also, but rather than just rest and uh, respite, it's also education, it's also reflection, it's also introspection. And it's also excitement. One of the things I was excited reading about um, your wonderful newsletter that you said I got the latest one this month is something called the MAP Academy, um, an online learning and uh, encyclopedia project. Can you tell us about that? That's a very ambitious project that one of my colleagues, Nathaniel, came up with. And um, it really stemmed from this idea that uh, if you really look at why does India not have a museum going culture? And you know, this was a question when we were asking ourselves, we said, what is the education on Indian art that's available in India? And there is nothing in, the, in primary school that you learn about art. There are very few um, art courses that you even have. And most of the ones that are available are overseas. Uh, how would we expect people to come in if we do not also educate them? One is the job of a museum to do, but I think as a nation, as a country, and as universities, we need to do something there. Uh, so the MAP Academy is basically divided into four silos. The first is we are putting together an encyclopedia of Indian art. And um, I hate to say this, but there isn't a comprehensive encyclopedia on Indian art that exists, and this is 2020. So this is an encyclopedia being written from scratch. It's not to say that you do not find information on whatever you're looking for, but it's not all very organized, nor is it all very factual, and nor is it all as comprehensive as you would find in an encyclopedia. It's too much to say that we can do this, but we are attempting to do, do this. And at the first stage, we are only doing two and a half thousand entries. The second is a series of courses on Indian art, which will be offered through various universities and even online. So it could be intermediary, it could be a, a diploma course. And if you needed it certified, then you would pay for it. Otherwise it would be free. 
The third is a tools and resources section where anything that's been published on Indian art, be it in any of the museums, in any of the exhibition catalogs, in any of the universities. So it would become a portal that you could find it together. And the fourth is films. Uh, you know, we realize that this is the way people are going to consume uh, education going forward. So this is the plan that Nat has come up with. It's, um, we've already been speaking to many universities who are excited to tie up with us for this. Mm. This is terrific and, and really unusual in its brilliance. Um, I think taking on the um, dual aspects of a museum being a repository of knowledge in its collections, many of which of course are not and on show, though can be digitally represented, and then those that are on display being part of a, a theater for knowledge. And this idea of uh, being a catalyst and creating um, one free aspect, but then an online aspect that has a revenue generation um, is something that it makes me just say, let's, let's us be involved with you on that, Abhishek, um, as sure. a museum that has such a strong interest in particularly the art of India uh, post-war. Um, in terms of measuring success, um, what, what way will you know you've been successful in five years' time? Hmm. I guess uh, there are many measures for success. The traditional measure would have been possibly footfalls. Um, in a COVID era, I don't think footfalls is a great measure at all. And therefore, um, you know, maybe digital reach becomes important. Uh, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to continue, but uh, the other thing is also the breaking of different barriers that India has. Is it a barrier because of what a ticket costs to come to a museum? Is it a perception barrier? Uh, is it language? Is it because it's considered elitist? So breaking or if not breaking, at least finding a means to bridge that barrier would be one way of measuring success. The third would be, you know, what is the impact of what we are doing? Uh, how many people want to come back? How many people want to support us? How many people want to participate in the different things that we are doing? And how long is the queue outside the block? I wanted to save for, I mean, we're getting close to our hour, which has gone so quickly, Abhishek, but one of the most remarkable things about what you're doing is how you've embraced the current moment um, and you were scheduled to open uh, soon um, and now that will be um, uh, all of us willing um, next year. Um, but you have sort of seen a way to have uh, more than one opening through this digital arena. Tell us about that. Well, we thought that, uh, you know, ours is not a very large museum. And uh, I would imagine at full capacity, we can have about 200, 250 people at a time. So in our opening, um, on any given day, we can have that many people. And even if we stretched it to four or five days, we're talking about a thousand people. But how do we reach out to the whole world? How do we reach out to all the people who are not going to be in Bangalore? And this is also given the fact that we are hoping that COVID is taken care of and people want to congregate. So we said, why don't we look at a digital opening where we can invite everyone. And instead of having a thousand people, we can have a hundred thousand people. So that's what we are planning for. And uh, then the whole point was, why do we have to wait until the museum is ready? The building is ready. Why can't the museum be ready before the building is ready? So these are questions that, uh, of course, we have the answers for, but somebody had to ask these questions and it means a lot of work, but it's also a lot of excitement. I don't want to exhaust you, but um, uh, have you room, because I'm envisaging in the future, this is going to be a great success. Have you room on your current site to expand or would you think of having more maps like the Guggenheim around the world? We have no space to expand. We are building every square inch that we are permitted to. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have no space here, but we had an, an angel who came to our aid. And this uh, Jerry Rao, a dear friend who 
gifted his art collection to us. And when I joked and I said, Jerry, I don't have room for your collection because it's far too vast. And he says, but stop making excuses because I'm giving you two acres of land to build your storage facility on. So that might just become the branch two or, you know, we, we're going to be doing in phase two our con construction for the storage facility, but I would imagine it would also have galleries there. Do some of your corporate uh, friends um, think you're mad um, or do others, you know, feel inspired by you and want to be supportive and establish their own places? How's that going? I think all our patrons think I'm mad. <laughs> there isn't one who doesn't think I'm mad. Well, let's just celebrate that, Abhishek. This has been just a terrific hour with you. Um, you've answered so clearly and um, so inspiringly for all of us. Uh, I'm thrilled that everybody's joined us from such far-flung places and brought together by uh, these two machines, uh, you and me looking at each other as, as, as if we're in the same room. Um, we, we wish you so well. We congratulate the community. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for, Pam, for doing this and being such a partner to MAP. We look at... We look forward to doing many things together. Ever onward. Thanks very much indeed, okay? And best to your family and team. Take care and stay well. And Thanks. stay safe. Bye now. Bye now.